Okay, uh, welcome AP Euro students. This is your part two of chapter 15. Uh, really your absolute monarchs period here. We've got several more. There's a lot to this chapter, of course. Uh, so we've got several more topics we need to talk about. So let's talk about a little bit what happens after the Holy Roman Empire is fragmented by uh, the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, you get the rise of Brandenburg, Prussia, which are two different areas of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and you get the foundation of something called the Hohenzollern dynasty uh, under Frederick William, the great elector. Uh, he creates the Senate army. Uh, he, he's got a relationship with the nobles, which are called the Junkers. And he's going to have total control over his peasants and serfs. He is, in essence, an absolute monarch. Um, he exempted his nobles from taxation as a way to, I think, keep them on his side. So they'll not question his authority. Uh, and he favors mercantilism, which favors his nobility as well. It's going to put money in their pockets. Uh, after him comes Frederick III, uh, who becomes the king of this kind of new thing called Prussia. Uh, when we finally get a map down here in a little bit, you'll see that um, you know, it's, it's basically areas of modern-day Poland and areas of Russia, which would make sense with the name. Now we get the emergence of Austria as well, and remember Austria had been part of the Habsburg Empire, um, kind of a southeasterly portion of the Holy Roman Empire, and it's going to kind of break away and become its own thing. So the Habsburgs lost Germany, but they did gain an empire in southeast Europe with Austria, which becomes the Austrian Habsburgs. And you get Leopold I, who makes eastward expansion, which is going to bring him into conflict with the Ottoman Turks. Um, you get the development of a multinational empire uh, after the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, they'd lost Spain, but they do gain northern Italy, Hungary, Transylvania, Croatia, and Slovenia. Uh, so that's why you get all these ethnic groups, which is going to bring some issues uh, later on. Uh, so here you can see uh, what was the Roman Empire, and now it's it's breaking up. Here's Brandenburg. Um, you know, all these area, different areas of Germany, Prussia, West and East Prussia here. Uh, you get a Spanish presence in Italy, um, and but with the, one of the consequences of the the war of the Spanish succession was that they would lose influence in Italy, and Austria would basically take their place and emerge as the dominant power in Italy. So as you can see, Italy. Italy gets um, controlled by different groups, whether it be the French or the Spanish, or in this case, the Austrians. Um, here's Italy here. Um, Austria in 1521. Uh, here's Hungary taken from the Ottomans. The Ottoman Empire lost this territory. Uh, the Ottomans had, are not quite as powerful as they once were. All right, let's talk a little bit about Russia. And Russia tends to have pretty interesting history. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Ivan IV, uh, also known as Ivan the Terrible, who is the very first uh, true czar after Ivan III, uh, freed them from the Mongols and the, uh, the Khanate of the Golden Horde. And um, Ivan is a guy that was pretty good in his early days, and he really, historians divide him up into two periods, a good and bad period. Uh, the good period was highlighted by expansion and economic success, uh, but that was while his wife was alive. When his wife died, he, he basically went crazy. He blamed the nobles for killing her. He thought that they had poisoned her, and it just changed everything about him. And he would end up, uh, his son, his young son, had uh, his wife was pregnant with child, and he got into an argument with her about the way that she was dressed, which he thought was a little loose for court society. And uh, he beat her. And so his son uh, came upon him and um, basically got into an argument with him about the beating of his wife. And in a fit of rage, Ivan IV struck out with his scepter and hit his son in the head. And it killed him. And the only son he had left was uh, mentally incapable of ruling the, the empire. He was, uh, uh, he was handicapped. And so right there in, in that stroke, Ivan IV destroyed his dynasty. And so his wife's family was the Romanovs, and they would end up taking over with Michael Romanov in 1613. 
And the Romanov dynasty would rule uh, all the way up into 1917, where, of course, the infamous uh, incident with Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family being killed uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution. Now, Russia had been pretty much outside of all the cultural movements, such as the Renaissance and Reformation. Uh, they were sort of backwater European, if you will. But that's about to change under the reign of a well-known absolute monarch called Peter the Great. Um, and you can see his rule there, a fairly lengthy rule. Uh, he was a, a giant of a man, enormous, six foot eight. Uh, as you can see there, big, crude, and rude. Um, but he's really famous for making these, really famous for making these uh, voyage, uh, not voyage, uh, trips to Western Europe, something called the Grand Embassy. And it's pretty cool because here he is, a, a powerful and wealthy monarch, and he's going to go incognito. He's going to go in disguise uh, and take all these low-level jobs uh, in the West, and he's basically a spy. He's taking the secrets of mercantile success in Western Europe, and he's going to bring them back to Russia with him. Um, so, And that's his desire, is to westernize Russia. It's fairly successful his westernization of Russia, but it is going to upset some of his nobles uh, for certain reasons. So he reorganizes his armed forces and his central government. He's going to divide massive Russia up into provinces, and he has this really crazy 25-year uh, term for drafted men, you know, to serve 25 years in the military. Uh, it is going to get him a large army of 210,000, and he has these ideals where he wants Russians to have a sense of civic duty, um, but and he's going to require nobles to serve as military civil officers. He has this, this table of ranks that organizes the how uh, nobles and non-nobles should be promoted. It's kind of complicated. But his mercantilist policies aren't enough to fund this large military that he has, and so it's going to make him resort to taxing the peasants. And that's going to bring hardships, as you can imagine, upon the peasants. Well... It'll click for me. There we go. All right. Now, uh, much like the Byzantines, um, remember them as part of the Orthodox Church, uh, Russia is also Orthodox. And just like the Byzantine uh, emperors, he's going to have state control over the Russian Orthodox Church. He's also going to introduce Western customs and styles, uh, even going as far as forcing his nobles to shave their beards because Europeans didn't wear beards. They only had mustaches. Uh, this did have many of them view him as a tyrant, although he did allow them to keep their beards as long as they paid a beard tax. But again, you can imagine how uh, upsetting this would be to the Russian boyars, the noblemen. Now, his impacts did have a positive reform on women. Uh, women do see some, uh, some rights gains under his rule. Um, and he is going to bring Russia in. He's going to modernize their military. He's going to make them a military power. Uh, he's, he wants a warm water uh, seaport. He's going to fight Sweden um, for it, and he will finally get him one. He's going to build a new capital, uh, the city of St. Petersburg, which is actually named after his patron saint, uh, St. Peter, not himself personally. Uh, and, then, you know, they, there's some grand architecture. St. Basil's Cathedral is one of the more recognizable uh, architectures in the world. Kind of see uh, impressive there. Again, Peter, he's an interesting guy. He's got lots of stories about him. Um, you can do a little further research on uh, the great northern states, such as Denmark and Sweden. Just you know, quick little backdrops on them. Denmark's going to take some losses because of the Thirty Years' War. Um, they have a constitutional crisis of their own and a revolution in 1660, while about the same time that England is restoring their monarchy, so they've been dealing with issues as well. Uh, they get an absolutist constitution proclaimed by 1665. Sweden has the famous Gustavus Adolphus, and you know he, he's, he's this military genius and makes Sweden a powerhouse, but uh, they also take some losses in the Thirty Years' War. And so, as you can see, the monarchs, they're just... Um, building empires right here, and we are moving more and more towards absolute monarchy. The Ottomans, uh, under Suleiman the Magnificent, they have these attacks against Europe. They're advancing in the Mediterranean under Suleiman. He's a, he's a pretty good one. Um, 
the Ottomans were viewed as actually a European power. Um, and, you know, they had a large bureaucracy and they had this, this force of uh, basically converted Christians called Janissaries. Uh, but the Ottomans eventually will uh, begin shrinking. And you can see their territory there. Okay, and I'll go through. You can click on these and look at them in more detail if you need to. It's a lot more than you're going to be able to remember. Right, limits of absolutism. Um, the power of rulers. If we're asking the question, do they rule absolutely? The answer's got to be no. I don't know that there's ever been such a thing as complete and absolute rule, uh, even some of, even under some of the world's greatest tyrants. Uh, local institutions are still going to carry their power. Uh, the authority of local agents in carrying out the monarch's wishes, privileges, liberties, and exemptions of special interests. They're quite simply, um, he can't have everybody against them. These absolute monarchs can't. And in some areas, the aristocracy is simply too strong. So you do get some limited monarchy. You even have some experimentations with republics. Uh, the Polish monarchy is fairly weak. Um, and so, you know, you're not going to hear a bunch about them. They're not a big dog. Uh, you, do, you do get a golden age of the Dutch Republic. So they are a republic experiment. Uh, you get the House of Orange, uh, the States General versus the House of Orange. So there, you know, there is going to have some issues there. You're not you're certainly it's not an absolute monarchy. You know, we're looking at a republic. And the Dutch are going to become uh, Amsterdam. Their capital will become the commercial and financial center of Europe. It's going to take place. It's going to take Antwerp's place in Spain as the financial center. Uh, you get Rembrandt and people like that in this time period. It becomes a Dutch golden age of art. You get some of these very good Dutch paintings, you know, modern life, everyday life. All right. Now, England. England's got a bunch of issues. King James, and, and they start really here with King James I, um, who is fighting and arguing with Parliament all the time. Uh, he supports the idea of the divine right of kings, as you can imagine. Uh, his mother was Catholic, who was Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, but we know that, and you know, he's following Elizabeth. That's big footsteps to follow, and that's a Protestant England that he's stepping into. Um, you know, Parliament has the power of the purse, so when he needs money, he has to basically ask Parliament's permission for it. He's got to call Parliament. He's got to ask them for the money, and they've got to grant it. And that doesn't really fit in with his idea of uh, the divine right of kings. Now, he has some problematic religious policies. Uh, the Puritans are creating issues in England. Uh, they reject the bishops because they're hardcore, as you know, with the Puritans. Now, England's gentry, they're wealthy landowners and non-nobles. Uh, many of them had converted to Calvinism, so they're Protestant. And, you know, they have an issue here with uh, too much Catholicism. Um, James dismisses them. That's going to be a problem. Now, his successor is Charles I, and this is going to push us towards our move towards revolution. Uh, the institution of the Petition of Right, which was sort of a Bill of Rights, it acknowledges the rights of both Parliament and the people. So already England saying we're not down with this absolute monarchy stuff. Uh, there's no taxation without Parliament's consent. There's no cruel or unusual punishment that kings have done in the past. And there's no quartering of troops, which is interesting because these are some of the things that we're going to, as Americans, have a problem with later on uh, under King George III. Um, so Parliament refused to fund Charles's projects if he does not sign it. Um, personal rule, this period from 29 to 1640, uh, it's a rule with Parliament. He, he dissolves it. And he basically collects money in different way, in different ways, uh, the, you know, taking taxes off of ship money and stuff like that so that he doesn't have to get Parliament's permission for anything. Um, again, with with Charles, they're fearing more that uh, he's got a Catholic queen and they have a child and his, his Catholicism is going to be restored. And that's freaking people out. Um, so there's going to be an issue here. We get something called the Long Parliament. Charles forced to summon Parliament back to fund troops to crush a Scottish revolt. The Scots were giving him problems. He needs money. So now he has finally, after you know such a long time, uh, back. Uh, but when he does, Parliament places severe limits on his power. 
And then they placed this triennial act, which says they must meet every three years as a way to prevent him from not calling them back. Uh, Charles would end up trying to arrest some Puritans in the parliament, but that backfired and it will cause the English Civil War. Now, this Civil War is roughly six year period in English history, and it pits the roundheads, which is parliament, versus the cavaliers or the royalists. Um, in the first phase, Parliament had success against the king uh, under this new army and their general, Oliver Cromwell, who is a Puritan. Um, so the Parliament uh, splits itself between Presbyterians and independents because you got this religious issue here. And we know that Puritans are really hardcore and Presbyterians pretty much too as well. Uh, second phase, 1648. After Charles tried to flee, he was recaptured and... Um, you know, all you got left now are radical Puritans in Parliament, uh, known as the Rump Parliament, and they would end up executing Charles the First, a public <clears throat> public execution, which was uh, virtually unheard of of a monarch. When monarchs were uh, gotten rid of, it was typically done in secret by assassin or poison or something like that. But he's uh, going to be beheaded. All right, so Cromwell gets in. He abolishes the monarchy. Uh, he declares England a republic. Although he doesn't really, he really serves as a dictator. He's calling it a republic, but in, in actuality, it's really a dictatorship under uh, Cromwell's um, watch, basically. Many Irish and Scottish were sent to the American colonies as indentured servants by Cromwell. Uh, he, you know, he can be very brutal in Ireland and Scotland. Uh, he, he faces troubles with radicals and parliament. And now his policies, uh, his position was called Lord Protector. Um, and England was ruled by Puritan military generals that answered to him. And he was by far more a tyrant than Charles I ever was. And when he died in 1658, his son briefly takes over as Lord Protector, but the English have had enough. And they decided things can be actually worse than having a king. So we're going to restore the monarchy. All right. So you have civil war in England in this period. And while this is going on, in America, you're getting solitary neglect. England has too much going on right now to worry about the colonies, which will set them up, of course, for uh, to try to put down the American Revolution in 1776. Here's Cromwell, dressed much less flamboyantly than uh, Charles I and the other monarchs, but a tyrant nonetheless. So we get the Restoration Monarchy here with Charles II. Uh, Parliament, however, did get to keep much of its power. So with England, you're always going to have limited monarchs instead of absolute monarchs now. Um, there's still this issue of religion. Uh, decoration of indulgence pre it presents toleration for Catholics. But however, the Test Act, just a year later, it says that only Anglicans could hold military and civil offices. So they're not going to let Catholics hold that office. Uh, really trying to... Um, um, force people to be Anglican here. Parliament tried to pass a bill to prevent his Catholic brother James from the throne, uh, him being Charles II. Uh, Parliament was split again into two factions. You had the Whigs, who wanted to exclude James and establish a Protestant king, and the Tories, who supported the king and the hereditary throne. These guys were saying, hey, listen, he's next in line, so it should be his throne. So James will end up ascending to the throne, King James II. Uh, he's a devout Catholic, which is odd. He's in a Protestant majority uh, country here. Um, Protestant daughters Mary and Anne superseded by a Catholic son who was born in 1688. So you're looking at a Catholic dynasty now. Um, Mary and Anne were both Protestants, which would have been okay with the people of England. But now he has a son. And that son, they're worried, is going to uh, keep the keep the throne Catholic. Now, Mary goes off, and she's married to William of Orange of the Dutch Republic. So she has a powerful husband. And we're going to end up getting them on the throne, and James II is going to be, be sent packing. So we get something called a glorious revolution because there was no bloodshed this time. There was no repeat of the English Civil War. Uh, Parliament simply invites Mary and William of Orange to come take the throne. And they come, and and James gets out of there uh, before anything worse can happen to him. Uh, you get the English Bill of Rights in 1689, 
the Toleration Act of 1689 did not bring total religious equality, but it did put an end to most religious persecution in England forever. Um, and it did establish a firm role for parliament in the government, which it obviously still has. It ends the divine right theory in England. William was made king by parliament, not God. Simple as that. Um, and that's how they see it. Um, the role reversal of king and parliament, who makes who? Um, these, they're going to share power. Uh, James's Stuart descendants still alive in France, Italy, uh, and revolts in Scotland happen later on. So what are some responses to the revolution? Uh, Thomas Hobbes, which you know from the Enlightenment, uh, writes the Leviathan. He had lived during the English Civil War, and he, um, he, he didn't feel like people had a right to rebel. He thought that people were naturally bad, life was nasty, and that needed a very strong Leviathan-type government to keep people in their places. And, of course, the flip side of that coin was his opposite, John Locke, who writes the two treatises of government. And, of course, with Locke, we know he's so influential to the um, American Revolution and French Revolution. Uh, he lived during the Glorious Revolution, and he felt that people had inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property that no government could uh, trample upon. He thought that people had the right to revolt and that they could overthrow the government if it was deemed necessary but really only applying to wealthy gentry and nobles, uh, not necessarily the landless poor who really don't have much power. Uh, but this does give us the origins of enlightenment thought. So here you get some of the chronologies. I wouldn't worry too much about Poland or not. A big dog here. Dutch a little bit. Uh, England, I always need to know England. So there you can pause on that and just peek at it. All right. Also in this time period, you get a flourishing of European culture. Uh, you get different art. So we're out of the Renaissance now. You get mannerism, uh, which was an attempt to break away from balance, harmony, and moderation of the high Renaissance, uh, meaning in the manner of it imitated Renaissance masters, but with a personal flair of the new artist. Distorted rules of proportion, elongated bodies, uh, a lot of light and dark, uh, suffering of darkness with intense emotions, often religiously themed. There you can see sort of the elongated bodies. And that's a pretty sweet statue. Madonna with the long neck. Okay. Uh, the Baroque period. Uh, you get harmony of classical ideals of Renaissance art and a religious revival, uh, which became very popular in Catholic courts. Uh, 3D depictions of raw energy, action, and motion, motion um, intensely emotional and moving. Um, you basically got a rejection of Renaissance restraint, uh, but not of Renaissance steam, still religion and your Greco-Roman classics. Many curved lines and fleshy bodies, wild faces. Uh, you get French classicism, uh, emphasizes uh, clarity, simplicity, balance, and harmony of design. Uh, it wasn't as showy as the Renaissance was, less emotion, but extra grandeur and ornamentation. You also got Dutch realism, realistic portrayals of secular everyday life. You saw that in some of the paintings earlier, it's just normal, somebody's house, people just doing normal everyday things. Uh, commissioned by wealthy middle class, uh, not the nobles. It's reflected in the art by depicting regular people. You're not really seeing them sit for uh, the portraits. All right. Let's get some more artwork here. Oh, there's Artemisia, Judith, one of our favorites, right? <laughs> All right, there's Rembrandt. And you see the use of lights and darks. Not a whole lot of color in this picture, just a little bit of red right here. The rest of it is uh, light and dark. Uh, you also get under Queen Elizabeth, the Elizabethan age. Um, William Shakespeare, of course, who you all know well. Uh, this is the Golden Age. Uh, Globe Theater is where him and others, Marlowe and others, did their work. Um, Spain also has a golden century uh, kind of overlapping this time period. <clears throat> you get this Lope de Vega, who wrote about 1,500 plays, about of which about one-third survived. That's an incredible amount of work. Uh, French drama was for the nobility and not for the masses. Um, Jean-Baptiste Moliere, 
I wrote the misanthrope and uh, Tartuffe, I guess. Probably said it wrong. It's French. All right. So there we go. Uh, we'll end it with that, and hopefully we can, uh, you know, bring some clarity to this in class.